So I think it was 700 Slack workspaces that installed it um, of the wow. initial Product Hunt launch, including some like really well-known like brands that you might know. I remember going through the first list and I was like, wow, someone from NASA is using SimplePol. That's so cool. And then a lot of people in my kind of immediate environment were like, what the hell could you ever charge for? You couldn't charge for anything. Like what? It's in the name SimplePol. Like what features could you even have that anyone would be willing to pay money for? Hello and welcome back to Indie Bites, the podcast where I bring you stories from fellow indie hackers in 15 minutes or less. In this episode, I'm joined by Will Klopp, who is the founder of SimplePoll and has a ton to share about the story of building one of the most popular Slack apps out there and what it's like going full time on your side projects. A big thank you to the sponsor of this episode, Mugshot Bot. Mugshot Bot automatically generates unique, beautifully designed images for every page on your website or blog so you don't have to worry about them. This means you can focus on what matters, building your product and creating great content. Mugshot Bot is a tool I use personally and is made by another indie hacker, Joe Mazzalotti. To level up your link previews, go to mugshotbot.com forward slash indie bytes, link in the show notes to create an image for your site completely free. Let's get on with the episode. Will Klopp is the founder of Simple Poll, a super simple but powerful Slack app that has over 600,000 active users. Will now works on Simple Poll full time, having left his job at GitHub in September 2019, which is a year ago. Congrats Ooh. on leaving your job a year ago this month. Can't believe it's been that long. Yeah, it feels like maybe we're in May now. So I don't buy it's been a year, but I guess it has. <laughs> yeah, it's mad. And how's that year been for you? Are you? Has it been a bit of a roller coaster? I mean, so I, I don't think I was too worried really from any particular angle. I like to think that I take risks and stuff, but from a financial perspective, like it was not like a, a leap at all to go from that full-time salary to the living off the like MRR that SimplePoll was bringing in. But the past year has been really fun. It's really fun to like work on your own stuff, build it, actually ship it, talk to users more, double down on things you've been wanting to do for a long time, learn a ton. I think the past year I've really learned a lot of things that would have been hard to learn, like had I continued with a full-time job and then hacking on stuff on the side. So tell me a little bit more about Simple Poll. What's it all about? So Simple Poll is an app for Slack, one of the biggest, uh, most popular apps for Slack. It's been around for a couple of years now. And essentially what you can do is very quickly put together a poll that you can then post in a Slack channel. Uh, and then anyone who's a member of the Slack channel can vote on the different kind of options that you provide for that poll. And it's a super simple idea, but an effective one. Where did you come up with the idea and was no one else doing this? I started properly using Slack at some point in, I think like 2014 or 2015. And I think the specific moment when I realized that there was a little bit of a need for this is when we were trying to organize a hackathon together as a group. Uh, we were trying to decide on what item of swag to get everyone. So usually hackathons, everyone gets like a t-shirt or something like that, like a piece of swag. And someone had put together this like list of 10 to 20 different ideas for swag. And he wanted to like have everyone vote on what should be the option we'd go with. And then he manually tried to create a poll in Slack by writing out this elaborate message, choosing a different like animal emoji for each of the options, and then mm. clicking on each of the options in Slack to like have something for people to click on. And it just seemed like super tedious. So I think that's probably when the idea first started coming into my head. And then at one point I was bored at this conference I was at uh, and I didn't really want to go back to where I was staying. So I just stayed there overnight and hacked together the first prototype. <laughs> and literally like, yeah, like uh, an evening and then that was working. And then I spent another day building the landing page. And then I tweeted about it and then someone from Product Hunt put it on Product Hunt. And then a lot of initial folks found it from there. And then that's how it started off, yeah. You just tweeted, someone found it, and then you got users from that. How many users did you get from that first initial push on Product Hunt? So I think it was 700 Slack workspaces that installed it um, of the wow. initial Product Hunt launch, yeah. Including some like really well-known like brands that you might know. I remember going through the first list and I was like, wow, someone from NASA is using SimplePol. That's so cool. <laughs> and then shortly after that, it got put on, this, on the Slack app directory, which is like Slack's app store, essentially. And that's been really just fundamental in consistently driving traffic and driving new users to the app. This is something you put together really quickly overnight at a conference, landing page up the next day, and suddenly you've got 700 users from Product Hunt and it's now in the Slack app directory. Did you have to put much marketing into this or was it growing quite quickly organically? 
Yeah, no, I definitely didn't do much marketing at all. I posted the tweet and then went to bed. And then the next morning I woke up and it was on Product Hunt and I was like, wow, this is really cool. But yeah, not much marketing thinking went into it. And were you charging right from the start? Where it was, this, was this making you loads of money with all these users or... This was, yeah, it's completely free. So it's co completely free um, for the first couple of years. At the beginning, I didn't really even take it seriously, to be honest. I was like, this is a simple app I put together in two days. It does very simple things. There wasn't really any plans to charge for it at all. I think at some point I started thinking about, hmm, what, you know, could I charge for it? And then a lot of people in my kind of immediate environment were like, what the hell could you ever charge for? You couldn't charge for anything. Like what, it's in the name Simple Poll. Like what features could you even have that anyone would be willing to pay money for? And and then, yeah, the paid, paid version that kind of added a bunch of additional features didn't end up happening until November 2018. So almost three years later, but it grew organically over that time period. It's every week more people were using it, finding it useful, sharing it with their team. I think there's some inherent virality built in and that you install the app on your workspace, you create a poll, and then anyone who's in that channel can see the poll and learns about simple poll. And, and then they might know that they can create a poll and, and then can, can grow in that sort of way. So people are saying it's simple, what could you possibly charge for? What did you settle on charging for? So there were a couple of features that had come up again and again that I hadn't built yet. So I approached it from the perspective of, okay, I don't really want to take anything away from people. I want to give them something new and then charge for that. And that kind of worked partially. So the specific feature here was restricting the number of times each user could vote on a poll. This sounds like very nitty gritty, but basically means, okay, you make a poll and you want everyone to only be able to cast a single option, oh, sorry, a single vote. So you can't vote for everything. You can only vote for one thing. And that is a paid feature. I also looked at how uh, much usage we were getting from our top users. And I felt, okay, it probably makes sense to charge those users who use it the most and get the most value out of it. So I looked through some of the metrics and saw that, oh, wow, yeah, if I put a usage restriction uh, at this number, which was 100 votes cast in a workspace over the course of a month, mm -hmm. that means the vast majority of people could still enjoy Symbol Pool for free, like 90 plus percent. And only those who really use it the most, who are really getting the most value out of it, I could probably ask them to pay. And then the price I settled on was $49 a month. And yeah, a lot of them ended up being very happy to pay for that. Yeah. And so how has the growth been since you started charging that 49 bucks a month? Yeah, it's been really good in, so the, the, in terms of the revenue. I think this is also something that I very much underappreciated back then. In, in my mind, it was like, okay, I'm going to start charging people. And then within a week, I'll you know have all those revenue and I'll have all these users. But it turns out that this growth, which I think is very common for SaaS companies actually now having learned a bit more about it, is that you grow very consistently every week, every month. And, and that's what happened to Simba Paul. So every month there's more customers. Every week there's more customers. Mm. And how do you feel about building this app on top of Slack? Are you ever worried? Like this is your full-time gig now. You've got employees that you're paying for. What if Slack just goes and builds Simple Paul, Will? Yeah, this comes up every once in a while. And I think it's, a, it's an important question to ask. First of all, we have a really good relationship with Slack. So we chat to them on honestly a weekly basis. I think it's yeah very important to consider this from the Slack perspective. So would Slack want to do something like that? Or where do their priorities lie? And they've been building a platform, right? So they have a, a big team within Slack that is called the Slack platform team. And their job is to grow the ecosystem of Slack apps that exist and mm. make sure that Slack apps can be useful within Slack. And strategically, it's a very kind of long term, but a very important bet that ultimately ends up driving a lot of customer stickiness for them. So you can imagine if you are a paying Slack customer, you might also be using apps. And some of the Slack's biggest customers have a ton of apps that they use, a ton of other integrations. And that might mean Zoom and Google Calendar and a bunch of custom built apps that maybe are only internal tools, but also yeah. apps like SimplePoll or many kind of independent apps that exist on uh, within Slack's platform. And then if, if that customer ever decides, okay, there's an alternative to Slack that we might be trying out. Maybe it's cheaper, maybe it has a feature that we really like. It becomes very hard for them to leave Slack because it means not just leaving behind messages and files, but it means leaving behind all of their custom integrations, all of the other apps that exist within Slack that they would have to leave behind. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. And you've now left your full-time job sort of 10 months after you started charging. Well, that's the dream for indie hackers to go full-time on their side project. 
what advice would you give to founders that are really working to get to that point and and are really struggling to get there I think saving up money can be very helpful to ultimately take this leap. And this might be obvious, but having a strong financial cushion that you can always fall back on is really helpful. So yeah, I guess it depends on kind of what state you're in. But if you're in a position where you are working a full-time job, you have a side project, you're kind of trying to monetize the side project, um, but it might not like make any money yet saving the money that you make from your full-time job is like a great starting point <laughs> yeah well the, I, I sort of think about it as you, your position of getting your side projects to a point where it's high in your salary while you're still working on it as a side project is important i know some people will leave their full-time jobs and work on something that's not making money because they go oh if i work on it full-time i can make money but I honestly believe if you can't get it to the point, what are people on three, four thousand a month? If they can't get their business to that point, then leaving your full time job. If you want to eat into your savings, fine. But I think a lot of people should be able to get their business to that point before they leave the security of a full time job. That's a great point. I'm glad you framed it in that way. I definitely think I'm also in that camp that have enough MRR so that you can sustain yourself before leaving your job and otherwise stay within the comfort of the job. I think having a, a job actually gives a nice amount of structure to your day to day, including for side projects, because it means, all right, you might have to work nine to five, 10 to six, whatever it might be. And that means very clearly you can do a little bit of work in the evening and it needs to be very focused. You need to work on the most important thing. And then you have the weekend as well. Shout out to Weekend Club, uh, where you can find <laughs> a community of like-minded peers to build side projects on the weekend. But yeah, so I think you have a lot of structure in that sense. And that really forces you to focus on building the most important things that will most get you to that initial bit of revenue with your side project. Leaving a full-time job actually takes away a little bit of that structure and means you now feel like you can do all these other things. And unless you're really good at prioritization, it might be harder to get to more revenue. I agree with you there. I think it makes sense to get to that level of MR before leaving your job. I'm super interested in how you found now working on your project full time, because when I was speaking to Harry Dry, I said, what's your biggest struggle with marketing examples? And he goes, it's nothing to do with marketing examples, James. It's working on my own and being accountable. When, when you first left your job, how did you structure your day and start to make sure you were getting done what you need to get done? This was definitely a struggle for me. And I think all of those things like loneliness, structuring the day, accountability, I definitely won't pretend like I have solved them. <laughs> this was definitely part of the reason also why I decided to hire like a full-time engineer. Um, working with a team makes a huge difference to, I think, your mental health. So yeah, immediately after I left my job, I was working by myself. I had some ideas for things I wanted to do, but there's a lot of stuff that I feel like you never really get taught how to do that is just either there for you or you never need to worry about it, such as like working within a team, having people around you that can keep you accountable in some way, having some kind of daily structure. I think I had a few days after I left my job where I was like, all right, so I've left my job now. The MRR is still there. It's still growing with the same <laughs> amount of effort I needed to put in before. So now I can just, you know, lie in bed and watch YouTube all day. <laughs> and I did that for a day or two. And then I just felt completely miserable because I was like, wow, this is not what life is about. This is completely unfulfilling. But yeah, you need to build up this structure for yourself, like set goals for yourself, where you want to go, figure out how you want to spend your day to day, what kinds of things motivate you and what don't motivate you, how you want to keep yourself accountable for hitting your goals. And yeah, I think in a company you have structures, like you have a manager, you have a schedule, you have meetings, you have like company wide goal setting processes, you have coworkers who can give you feedback, you have all of that. And you don't have that as like an indie hacker or especially as a full time indie hacker. So coming up with some kind of structure that, that works for you, which is really easy to say and really hard to do is something that yeah, I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, I think everyone should figure out. So there's like pros and cons. I think many upsides. There's a lot of value in owning your own thing, building your own thing. And in many ways, it is the dream. But yeah, it's easy to forget about the bad parts of the past or the bad parts of having a job and, and easy to just see the bad or the, the difficult parts of being an indie hacker. Well, you've been a fantastic guest. I'll round it up on one final question and a few quick fires. First of all, what's your favorite book for indie hackers? the great CEO within. And I need to say something about this because a lot of the <laughs> advice in there isn't necessarily geared towards indie hackers. Lots of tactical tips, but you need to filter out the bits that are relevant to indie hackers and ignore the things that are clearly meant for venture businesses. Uh, favorite podcast? 
uh, Art of Product podcast. Just two indie hackers chatting. Great podcast. Yeah, love the Art of Product. And then finally, Will, who's an indie hacker that, that we should follow? Natalie Nigel. She mm. is CEO of Wildbit that makes some amazing products like Postmark, which I've been a very happy uh, user and customer of. And I think she's just like a very impressive person who's built this incredible business. Thank you so much for joining the Indie Bytes podcast. This has been fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Indie Bytes. If you did enjoy this episode, I'd love you to share the episode with just one indie hacker that will find it useful. As always, you'll find links for everything discussed in the episode in the show notes. That's all from me. Enjoy the rest of your day.